Good morning, every, er, sorry, afternoon, everyone, and welcome to MuniCon. I'm Lisa Rosman. I'm the uh, Assistant Director of the Washington Stormwater Center. And today I have the honor of presenting um, Stephanie Blair, who is going to talk about the acute cere cerebrovascular, I knew I was going to mess that up, effects in juvenile coho salmon exposed to roadway runoff. Um, this is a research update on the toxicology of urban stormwater and coho salmon. And this was published recently in the Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aquatic Science. Um, I would like to say that I am, I'm gonna get a little teary, I think. I'm so proud of our grad students, um, of which Stephanie is one. She's our PhD candidate. And just hearing these folks talk, um, Stephanie is an amazing and brilliant scientist. And it gives me hope for the future when I see these, these guys do these things. So, um, so with that, I will give you Stephanie Blair. Thanks, Stephanie. Thanks, Lisa. And thank you everybody for attending. Um, again, my name is Stephanie. I'm uh, working with Dr. Jennifer McIntyre looking at the toxicity of urban stormwater runoff to Pacific salmon. And I'll be talking today again about my research, um, particularly on the blood vessels that are impacted by these runoff pollutants in the coho brain. So this research comes out of a multi-institutional effort uh, through Washington State University and the Washington Stormwater Center. I want to also acknowledge our partners at the US Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, and the Center for Urban Waters, uh, University of Washington, Tacoma. I also have the great pleasure of working with Dr. Clyde Barlow at the Evergreen State College, who is assisting with the blood physiology and plasma leakage experiments that I'll talk about today. So the concern over stormwater has really grown in recent decades, particularly due to salmon declines and the acknowledgement that stormwater is a major source of pollutants in the Puget Sound region. With the ESA listing of Chinook and Steelhead, it's even more critical that we address the problem of urban stormwater runoff, which has prompted our research group to really investigate the toxicity of urban stormwater runoff to Pacific salmon. So in our group, we focus on coho salmon because we know that coho are a very sensitive species to runoff exposure. And this problem came to light in the 1990s when high rates of coho pre-spawn mortality were documented in many Seattle area urban streams. There was also at this time anecdotal evidence that linked these recurrent die-off events to rainfall events and therefore storm, storm water exposure. Post-project spawner surveys that were conducted in restored sections of urban streams observed really high incidences of fish like the one in this picture, a female carcass that's full of eggs, indicating that she had died before spawning. In healthy streams and in these restored uh, river sections, we would hope to see this, a female carcass that had successfully spawned before death and therefore is empty of eggs. So our partners at NOAA conducted a full forensic investigation to try to determine what was the cause of these pre-spawn mortalities. But they found that the fish were not dying from any known physical, chemical, or biological cause of fish mortality. Additionally, landscape analysis revealed that watersheds with higher impervious surfaces, roads, and traffic also had higher incidences of coho pre-spawn mortality, uh, also pointing to stormwater. Spawner surveys that were conducted over the entire fall season year after year showed very high pre-spawn mortality rates, such as shown in the figure here. Along the x-axis, we have Longfellow Creek in Seattle over a couple of years, Des Moines Creek and, and Piper's Creek, showing pre-spawn mortality rates as high as 63 to 100%. Now these rates are particularly striking when considering that in non-urban watersheds, such as Fortson Creek on the far right of this figure, coho pre-spawn mortality rates are usually less than 1% in healthy streams. So at the really high rates of pre-spawn mortality, we know that these coho populations are really unsustainable. And that doesn't seem likely to change in West unless we address the problem of stormwater runoff. Now in our lab, we study a very particular type of stormwater, which is roadway runoff. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, the first reason is that, you know, the landscape analysis really pointed to roads and heavy traffic as being a strong predictor of coho pre-spawn mortality risk. And secondly, exposure experiments to adult coho that were conducted using roadway runoff from this section of 520 in Seattle showed that coho were really dying in the same way in exposure to pollutants coming off these roadways. 
And what I mean by that is the acute mortality response was elicited by this exposure. They also developed very similar behaviors and uh, symptom development is what was observed out in field studies. And additionally, coho were found to be more sensitive than other species such as chum. And this matched field observations where following a rainfall event, there would the streams would be strewn with carcasses of uh, pre-spawn mortality coho, but chum really seemed to be successfully spawning. Now, uh, at this time, there are you know, hundreds or potentially thousands of pollutants that could be found in roadway runoff. Uh, you can see by the pictures at the bottom that that beaker is containing roadway runoff that's really a dark color indicating there's a lot of material coming off of these roadways. So it really seemed at first like a needle in the haystack to try to figure out what exact pollutant might be driving uh, this, these mortality symptoms. But thanks to the wonderful work for our, our partners at the Center for Urban Waters, our um, analytical chemistry collaborators there, uh, they conducted fractionation studies using tire wear particle leachate and were able to sift through hundreds of contaminants to find really a single contaminant that elicits the same acute mortality response and also the same results that we are seeing in the CHUM versus COHO mortality studies. And that chemical um, was a tire chemical called 6-PPD quinone, which is a transformation product of a chemical that is found in tires that protects the tire surface. And so it's very commonly added to passenger tires, which make it, makes it a very ubiquitous contaminant. And so the fact that um, this contaminant uh, was found to be acutely toxic to coho was really wonderful. Um, but it is an unknown chemical, so we don't know anything about its toxicity other than the response to coho, which makes it a particular challenge to figure out how this chemical might be driving the biological effects. So that's where my research comes in. So my research investigates the toxic mode of action of coho exposed to runoff, trying to understand how organs might be affected by this tire chemical, um, how it's damaging them, and what are the mechanisms that lead to death. We believe that the cardiorespiratory system is mainly targeted uh, by the contaminants in runoff, and that's really driven by the behavioral symptoms that you see in this symptomatic fish that's being exposed to 50% roadway runoff. So what you're seeing is uh, the surface swimming and circling that fish often exhibit before death. Um, and so in this juvenile co, you're seeing it, its nose is actually sticking out of the water. So this behavior can indicate that the fish is having trouble getting oxygen to tissues or utilizing that oxygen tissues that's related to that cardiorespiratory distress. This fish is at that transition of going from surface swimming to loss of equilibrium where the fish is not even able to hold itself upright in the water, which also can indicate that the neurological symptoms are being affected. And these symptoms really develop very quickly, so within a period of four to seven hours after exposure to the runoff. Now, in studies previous to mine, there have been a slew of blood physiology parameters to try to pinpoint what part of the cardiorespiratory system may be damaged. And one parameter that really sticks out as very consistent and dramatic is a hematocrit rise. So hematocrit is the percent volume of the blood that's taken up by the red blood cells. So the higher the hematocrit, the thicker the blood. Now fish are really known to have a hematocrit rise in response to stress. It's just considered a general stress response. And the reason for that is if they have more concentrated red blood cells and hemoglobin that carries oxygen within those cells, it does help to help push more oxygen and get it to tissues. But there's a threshold where if the hematocrit becomes too large, the blood becomes too thick to really move and to circulate um, to be able to even deliver oxygen. So what you're seeing in the figure here is uh, the fish juvenile coho that are exposed to 50% roadway runoff. And you're seeing the individual hematocrits uh, by each of these triangle, uh, red triangle points. And what you're seeing is that hematocrit can rise up to 70 to 80%, which really is quite severe and indicates it could be past that adaptive threshold. Now to give you a little bit more information on other studies that have looked at general stress responses in salmonids uh, to different types of um, stressors such as acute hypoxia and exercise stress, um, this table here is giving you a figure of how those stressors affect hematocrit. 
So in these controlled experiments that used rainbow trout, uh, Chinook, and coho, uh, you can see here that baseline hematocrit levels in the control group can vary between 20 to 40%. And then when these fish are subjected to stressors, that elicits this general stress response, it can increase hematocrit up to six to 10 percentage points when subjected to hypoxia. And the maximum hematocrit values we see from these studies is around 50%. And then similarly, when the fish are subjected to acute exercise stress, it can increase up to 17 percentage points, but we're really seeing that maximized out at around a 40% hematocrit. Now compare that with the hematocrits that we're seeing in coho exposed to runoff. The hematocrit is increasing by 12 to 42 percentage points, and we're seeing hematocrit values as high as 70 to 80 percent, which is nowhere seen in these studies that are conducted looking at general stress responses. So this is really pointing that something pathological is happening that could be related to death. So the jumping off point in my thesis research was really to look at explanations for these hematocrit rises um, as related to cause of death. So to start my experiments, I started by collecting roadway runoff, uh, collecting grab samples from a heavy traffic section of Highway 16 in Tacoma, Washington. And then I froze the storm water before the exposures. And this is really for feasibility. So it takes quite a while to set up the exposures, wait for them to develop uh, symptoms, and then uh, sample and prepare the tissues for these studies. So in order to make these studies feasible, I had to freeze the storm water first. Now, after thawing the stormwater just prior to experiments, they're diluted to 50% in these 30 liter glass aquaria, which are housed in a temperature controlled water bath. And the exposure continues until the fish develop symptoms and they're sampled at the loss of equilibrium stage. And each runoff fish is then uh, compared to a paired control. So a control fish is then sampled after the runoff exposed fish develop symptoms. Now, in the initial blood physiology studies, I looked at three parameters to help explain the initial mechanisms of hematocrit rise. So the first one is mean cell hemoglobin concentration in this figure, and that's the concentration of hemoglobin that's within the red blood cells themselves. Next, I also measured total hemoglobin, which is the total hemoglobin concentration of whole blood. And then the third parameter in this figure is hematocrit. Again, the percentage volume of the blood that's taken up by red blood cells. I used multivariate statistical methods to analyze the difference between control and runoff groups, and also to identify if there's statistical significance for each of these parameters. So what the figure here is demonstrating is that we did see a significant decrease in the mean cell hemoglobin concentration, a significant increase in total hemoglobin, as well as hematocrit consistent with previous studies. Now, what these parameters mean is that there are multiple mechanisms of hematocrit rise taking place. And so this diagram helps to kind of explain three basic mechanisms of a hematocrit rises in fish and how each of these parameters helps to identify which of these uh, mechanisms are present. So on the far left is showing what maybe a, a pre-stress example of the ratio between red blood cells to blood plasma uh, would look like, and then visually how each of these uh, mechanisms would, would, would look. So in the first mechanism, we have red blood cell swelling. This is also you know, something that occurs when fish are stressed. The cells actually take in water. And as they take in water, the red blood cells expand. They take up a larger volume, which increases hematocrit. And it also dilutes the hemoglobin inside the cells, which is why we see a decrease in mean cell hemoglobin concentration. Now, if red blood cell swelling was the only reason for hematocrit rise, we wouldn't see a change in the total hemoglobin concentration of whole blood. So because we did see that in the previous slide, we know that either red blood cell recruitment and or plasma loss is also taking place because of that increase in total hemoglobin. Now, red blood cell recruitment is also known to occur in fish. They actually store red blood cells in their spleen, and when they're stressed, they can contract the spleen to push more red blood cells into circulation. However, this really only has a slight effect on hematocrit. You really wouldn't see 
dramatic hematocrit rises with this mechanism. So this really points to plasma loss as being uh, one of the primary points of interest in explaining these severe hematocrit rises. So the next stage of my, of my experiment was to look at two potential mechanisms for severe plasma losses. And so I tested each of these hypotheses. The first one is that the plasma could be lost from plasma dehydration if the chemical is affecting the osmoregulatory system of a fish, uh, which controls the movement of ions in water between the vascular system and the tissue space. So if plasma dehydration is occurring, then water is actually leaving the blood vessels. And then everything that's left behind would be severely concentrated inside. So to test for that, I measured three types of plasma constituents. So I measured total protein. Um, there's all different kinds of carrier um, proteins, transport proteins, um, uh, regulatory proteins within the blood plasma. A very abundant protein is albumin which is very rich in these thiol groups. So I measured total thiols as a proxy for this particular protein albumin. And then I also measured antioxidant power. So the plasma has many types of antioxidants like vitamin E, vitamin C, uh, albumin, bilirubin. So this measurement measures the total reducing power of all these antioxidants combined. And then collectively what I predicted is that, that uh, plasma dehydration was occurring. I would see a dramatic increase in the concentration of these plasma constituents. Now, in the second hypothesis, uh, it may be that the red blood cells um, or the blood vessels can become leaky and whole plasma may, may actually be lost. In that case, we might not necessarily see an increased concentration of those plasma constituents. So in the first hypothesis, uh, that I tested, looking at the blood plasma results, I see that there really was no change in antioxidant power or in total thiols, which discounts the presence of plasma dehydration by osmoregulatory disturbance. There was, uh, with statistical testing, maybe a slight increase in plasma protein. Uh, this could be potentially explained by just the, the stress itself of being exposed to pollutants until death. Um, that stress can elicit proteins, uh, inflammatory proteins and um, uh, circulating um, cytokines that can uh, potentially explain the slight increases in proteins that we were seeing. Um, but overall, we were not seeing the dramatic increase in those constituents, which would point to plasma dehydration. So for the last experiment, uh, I tested for plasma leakage by, again, exposing the code to the point of loss of equilibrium in roadway runoff. And then I put the fish under anesthesia and then injected into the heart a fluorescent dye called Evans Blue and allowed that dye to circulate for about 10 or 15 minutes. And if there are any leaky vessels, then that Evans Blue would be able to move from the vascular space and leak into those tissues. And then the last step is to wash out the blood vessels with saline to completely remove any Evans Blue that was left behind within those blood vessels. And then the fish were uh, decapitated, their heads were frozen in this custom mounting media. So then I could take a hand planer and remove tissue. And what you're looking at are the fluorescent images of the coho heads uh, that are placed on their side. And you're looking at a cut that goes right down the midline of the fish. Highlighted in yellow is the brain regions, and then highlighted in red is the olfactory rosette regions. And what you can tell by these pictures is that in the runoff group, you see a great amount of accumulation of that Evans blue uh, in the brain and olfactory rosette regions of the runoff exposed coho, uh, which was completely absent in the controls, again, because the washout step had completely removed that tracer from the vascular space. Uh, we also see that we have an increase in hematocrit in these same fish, indicating that these two things are very likely to be related. Now, from the quantitative analysis, um, using an image analysis technique, you can see that the runoff, the accumulation of Evans blue dye in the runoff group is quite dramatic. It's in fact three orders of magnitude higher than what we see in the control group. Um, and so this, the severity of the accumulation really points to plasma leakage uh, and through the pathway of a compromise of the blood-brain barrier.
Now, the blood-brain barrier is impermeable to the passage of tracers like Evans Blue, as well as many other constituents in the blood plasma. And so therefore, uh, it really points to uh, continuing the investigation to look at how chemicals like 6-PPD quinone may be targeting the endothelial cells of the blood-brain barrier, um, causing an opening between the gaps between the cells called tight junctions, which allows tracers like Evans Blue to enter into the central nervous system, disrupt neuronal function, and ultimately lead to death. Now, right now I'm in the process of conducting histological uh, studies to confirm the plasma leakage. So what you're seeing is a very similar experiment, but this time I used uh, horseradish peroxidase injected into the fish um, that are treated very similarly. So in the control group, you see um, really an absence of brown staining throughout most of this brain tissue, um, which indicates that all of that tracer had been washed out. But in the runoff group, you can see from all of the brown staining throughout all regions in the brain that really there's a widespread um, uh, diffusion of this tracer that's leaking out of the blood vessels and just completely filling uh, that brain tissue space. So for my continuing research, I'm going to um, keep going with the tracer studies to really make a link between blood-brain barrier disruption and symptom development, looking uh, at using fluorescent tracers to see the correlation between pre-symptomatic stages of runoff exposure to the surfacing stage to the loss of equilibrium stage, um, to really look at those relationships. I'm also interested in looking at uh, sublethal effects of blood-brain barrier disruption in Chinook and steelhead, since these are species of high conservation concern in the Puget Sound. Uh, we know from previous studies that the Chinook and steelhead are vulnerable to stormwater, but they're just not as sensitive as coho, meaning that there may be some mortalities, but it's nowhere close to what we're seeing in coho. Uh, but the question really is, if the toxic mode of action is affecting the blood-brain barrier, do we see sublethal effects that may be impacting survival of these species uh, out, out in the field? And then lastly, what I really want to pinpoint is potential pathways linking how contaminants like 6-PPD quinone might be affecting the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and the purpose for that, it could be really useful in developing more targeted assays that are more sensitive in evaluating the toxicity of stormwater pollutants, as well as evaluating the effectiveness of green stormwater infrastructures at removing that toxicity. And lastly, I'd like to um, give a special thanks to all of the technicians and graduate students and collaborators that helped make this research possible. Um, thank you all for listening, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Great. Thanks so much, Stephanie. That was an amazing um, presentation. We do have a couple of questions. Um, let's see. So the first one is, if the tracer can get into the brain, why is it not also washed out? Does the tracer get washed out in the control group or is it never getting in? That's a great question. So um, yeah, so the, the tracer is getting into the brain. I'll go back to the figure to help kind of demonstrate. Um, so in this illustration here, what I was showing that if the tight junctions, which is that space in between the endothelial cells in, in um, that makes up the blood vessel in the brain, if that tight junction is closed, which is a normal state in the control group, um, then when you inject this tracer, which is symbolized by these blue dots, it doesn't pass those tight junctions. So the tracer will just stay in the blood vessels. And then during the washout step, all of that tracer is removed because all of the red blood cells, all of the plasma, everything contained in there is being washed out, which is why we don't see an accumulation uh, in of Evans Blue in the image analysis study. Uh, in contrast, if the endothelial cells are being affected so that those tight junctions open, then that creates these gaps that allows plasma constituents to be able to leak through those tight junctions and then ends up in this tissue space. And if that happens, it's really difficult to wash out, particularly if you have a high molecular weight tracer like the one that I was using. Um, that, that tracer will actually just stick around in the tissue space uh, if the blood-brain barrier is disrupted. Great, thanks, Stephanie. The next question is, um, if the tracer can get into the brain, oh, no, that's the same one, I'm sorry. We do have more questions, I apologize. Um, uh, okay, 
In your opinion, is there a simple method to test our streams to better understand which streams have a high potential for pre-spawn mortality? Yep. Uh, also a good question. So our collaborators have looked uh, at this question based on the landscape studies. So they took uh, decades of pre uh, spawner surveys that found documented cases of coho pre-spawn mortality and looked at the landscape characteristics and compared those to other watershed basins that has less coho pre-spawn mortality to figure out which of those uh, characteristics were the best predictors. And so based on that, we do have a way to look at which watersheds have more traffic density, have higher impervious surfaces, to be able to um, predict streams that haven't been surveyed um, that might have a high risk of coho pre-spawn mortality. So there's a couple of papers. Um, the lead author was Blake Feist, who published two papers on this topic. Um, I could definitely um, point you um, to those papers because uh, they really give an excellent description of the process. And then also they have maps that kind of you can actually work with to um, pinpoint specific locations or streams that people might be interested in surveying in the future based on that risk. That is a great resource. Stephanie, can you drop the link in the chat if we have time? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then the last question, I'm sorry, we're running out of time. There's all great questions. What can municipalities do to aid in um, your and other scientists' 6 PPD quinone research? This is being talked, out, talked about a lot. So Stephanie, what's your, what's your opinion about that? Oh, I mean, we have so many great research questions and just like not enough time or resources to be, to investigate all of them. So um, yeah, I mean, it'd be great to just have more funding, have more grad students, you know, have, um, yeah, have more time <laughs> to be able to, <laughs> to track down all of these questions. Um, but, you know, I, I think that our work is definitely getting the attention that it needs and it deserves. So other research groups can start um, building on a lot of the work that we're doing, uh, which is why, you know, it's important for us to share, you know, as our research is, is taking place, you know, what the results are with the community and to let them know about um, this problem and to let them know how important it is to keep investing in it. Right. Um, it looks like Heidi Sigelbaum put the link in the chat box. So that's perfect. Thank you so much. Um, all right. With that, I think we are out of time. So thank you again, Stephanie. That was an amazing presentation. And these presentations will all be um, up on our website in a couple of weeks. So if you want to watch it again um, and the other ones as well, um, you can do it then. Um, otherwise, thank you all for joining us and take care. Bye. Thank you.